Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. All right, checking my audio levels. Seems a little loud. Okay, let's see if that's a little bit better. I think that'll work. Let me know, as always, if the audio seems off at all. I'll mention, well, I'll, I'll go through my normal intro script instead of mentioning a bunch of uh, random things real quick here, but, uh, but I did change something with my audio setup today. So, hello everyone, welcome, happy Friday. So this is a live stream covering the uh, core lessons that you would learn on your way to becoming a private pilot. So this might be the first uh, certificate that you get that would then allow you to go take the plane out uh, flying anywhere you want in the country. The goal here is to cover all of the content that would be covered if you were working on that license. Um, but I want to make a, a point of saying that the best way to learn to fly and really the only way to learn to fly is to work one-on-one -on -one with your own CFI. So yes, I am a real CFI uh, and I'm hoping that these lessons are useful to you either in your sim flying or your real world flying if you're a pilot. Um, but if you are interested in learning to fly, and I hope you are, the best thing to do is to go to your local airport and find either a CFI or a flying school or a flight club and get set up with a demo flight. And that'll be an opportunity to go up and just practice uh, a little bit of controlling the airplane, see if you like the feeling of flying. Um, and if you're like me, after your demo flight, you'll be, you know, two thumbs up, I'd like to do this sort of thing. Um, I mentioned that these are all the lessons for the private pilot uh, syllabus. This will cover everything that you would need from never having flown before all the way through uh, having your pilot's license. Uh, we're on about lesson, it's a lesson 11. And so there's been several topics now that we're building on top of. I am uh, intentional about how I construct the lessons so that if you're just tuning in for a random one here or there, Hopefully you'll still pick up some useful pieces of information. If you do want to watch old lessons, they're up on uh, YouTube and uh, well, some of the more recent old ones are on Twitch, but uh, the archives are all on YouTube. So there's a link from the about page and I can actually post it in the chat here. If after the live stream, you're watching one of these and you have a question that comes up, feel free to post on Discord, which I will also post here. Um, it's a great place for feedback, questions, or just general flying community um, sharing things you found or, or interesting tidbits. If you have any questions during the live stream, of course, you're welcome to use the Twitch chat and I will uh, keep an eye on that to make sure that I'm answering anything that comes up. I'll mention the audio thing that I alluded to at the beginning, so I had talked about maybe two lessons back that I was going to try and figure out how to make it so I could hear the airplane while still streaming the audio out and that there was sort of this um, odd, I'm using OBS to do my streaming, uh, and there's sort of this odd audio interaction thing that I had to figure out. I think I have it set up now where you will be able to hear the audio while I am also hearing the audio. Um, there is a non-zero chance that something goes really wonky with that, so if you notice anything while I'm flying that's distracting or um, or the audio levels are just wrong for some reason. Uh, give me a heads up and I will see what I can do to fix it. And if you're ever curious about like the back end, like how I'm setting these up or the tools I'm using for my notes or any of those sorts of things, um, I'm always happy to talk about the implementation side. Um, it might be best for a Discord question because then I can give you a, a more full answer, but you're welcome to just post in the Twitch chat too and if I can answer quick, I'll... I'll give you a, a, a little bit more information. All right, I'm seeing that my Twitch um, bandwidth is looks like it's fluctuating a little bit, which is uh, something we've seen lately with the storms, I think is what's causing it in the Bay Area. Um, so we'll see, hopefully it stabilizes here. All right. Um, I think that's it for background information. Um, I'll mention now and I'll mention also when I hop into VR, when I'm using my VR headset, I can't see the Twitch chat. So if you do ask any questions, I will check it periodically and try and get back to you then. And that's it, no follow-up from last flight. Um, 
And so let's dive right in today with forward slips. And one thing I'll mention about forward slips before we get too far into it is the lesson, the ground session of this is, well, actually, you know, I could just pull up the, um, the whole thing. Um, I'll mention this in case you are deciding whether or not you want to stay tuned in for the live stream today. We'll talk about forward slips to a landing, but then we're going to spend most of the time flying, practicing the pattern, going through all of the um, procedures that we use around the pattern, and then practicing those forward slips to a landing. Um, so it will be, pull this up here. Here is my uh, notes for today. So objective is to develop knowledge, risk management, and skills associated with forward slips to landing. A couple of useful references, the uh, Airman Flying Handbook, uh, Approaches and Landings, POH, of course, for your aircraft, and then the pilot, private pilot ACS, those Airman Certification Standards, the standards that have to be met in order to get your pilot's license. This lesson builds on a normal crosswind, normal and crosswind approaches and landings. Um, it also, in some ways, builds on the things that we talked about in spin awareness and spin recovery, in that this will be a cross-controlled maneuver, and so we are at risk for a spin if we do it incorrectly. Um, in practice, we'll do it in a very safe way. We'll do it uh, kind of following the proper procedure, and so it's a very safe maneuver to do. Um, so I don't have it as building on the spins if you were trying to pick out which specific lessons to go in and look at. Um, but it is after that lesson for for a reason. Oh, we got someone taken off. Oh, you can't see it anymore. In the background of the sim, someone was just taken off. Kind of funny. Schedule for today, we'll do about uh, 0.5, about half an hour of ground time. And then we'll be practicing this on multiple flights. Uh, so, of course, with a student, every time we'd go up, we'd be doing takeoffs and landings. We'd be doing all of the pre-flight um, and those different... Um, skills to be building up what the right procedure should look like when you're out on the plane. For the live streams, we've been sort of focusing on just the core lesson content and not drilling on the past lessons. Um, but that repetition and that practice of those skills that we'd learned previously would be a really important part of, uh, of course, getting your actual pilot's license. Um, today we'll do a little bit more of that. So it's a short ground session and it's a skill that we can just go and practice. So we'll kind of do a couple of repetitions on that and talk about it as we go. Lesson elements, all right. So we have three things we'll cover, overview of forward slips, flying the forward slip, and then common errors. So the overview of forward slips, what are forward slips? Purpose of a forward slip is to lose altitude quickly without gaining airspeed. It allows for steeper glide descent for short field or emergency landing. So essentially what is happening in a forward slip is we are, uh, oh, that's sort of interesting. Uh, all right, kind of love my Git issues when that happens. Um, okay, what's the best way to do this? These are two very useful photos. Um, and I am going to uh, quickly, let's see if I can just re-pull from master and see what's going on here, from main, excuse me, and see what's going on here. Um, so I will time box fixing this to uh, no more than two minutes. So I'm a big, big fan of time boxing. So it's 11.09 now. Uh, well, it's just about 11.010. So at 11.12, then we will call these two a loss. But I think I can fix it sooner than that. I've actually had this problem before on here. For those of you who are curious, I use... Um, Uh, GitHub for storing all of my lesson plans and keeping everything uh, synced between devices. I do most of my writing and development on my Mac, but then stream from the Windows computer. So 
hence the occasional snafu between the two. Um, so I'm a little surprised just in that um, I haven't had this particular issue and I've been doing this for several weeks, but this is how this goes sometimes. Okay, Let's see if that worked. Okay, well, we have a plan B here. Um, so I'm gonna go into my, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty funny that it shows up um, in that one. Okay, so there is another way to do this. And I'm popping into those same references. The places where I get these diagrams that I show during our uh, ground review portions like this are all from the references that I put on top. So whenever there's an image in there, if you went into those references, you'd be able to find them. Um, all FAA um, materials and then uh, just essentially just cropped so that I can put it in the flow that I think works best. Um, but if you went into those resources, you would see them right there uh, pretty nicely. Okay, so let's do this and I will go, we'll try one real easy solution. Just see if I can, um, I think I can do that though. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Oh, I have several things missing from my. Huh. What I'm looking for is um, a way to quickly embed this PDF. Well, good, I suppose, that we don't have as much uh, to the ground session today. No, too optimistic. Okay, and then last but not least, Save this. Yeah, we can drop that right in there. Okay, so that will work well enough. So I just wanna show these two diagrams so we can talk about, again, we're talking about the difference between a forward slip versus a side slip. So a side slip we saw actually already for our takeoffs and landings. And it's a technique usually used for a crosswind landing to keep our heading parallel to the runway. Forward, slips are, forward slips are steeper than side slips with exaggerated bank into the wind and opposite rudder with heading significantly different than the runway heading, but ground track aligned with the runway heading. So the way to think about it and the reason that it's useful to see this picture here is the side slip is used so that our nose of the aircraft stays pointed down the runway regardless of the relative wind, so that we can keep our, um, our tires aligned with the center line of the runway. And so when we land, we don't have any side loading on the landing gear, right? We want to touch down such that the tires have no forces pushing left or right. We talked a lot about that. We talked about uh, crosswind landings. To contrast, a forward slip is where the relative wind, or where the, the direction of movement is directly down the runway, but the nose is pointed off to the side. And the reason that that's important is that we're actually turning the nose of the aircraft uh, using the rudder. We're, we're kind of pushing the nose out to one side to put the fuselage of the aircraft into the airstream. So we're essentially creating a, a very high drag situation so that we can force the uh, by, by pushing the fuselage into the airstream, 
When we do that, we create that high drag situation, we get a really steep descent rate. And so we start to sink really quickly. And so that then, that sort of forward slip motion is what allows us to lose altitude quickly without gaining airspeed. So we'll talk about places you might use this. Really uh, important ones would be maybe a short field landing or an emergency landing where you need to get to a specific spot and it's a good way to lose altitude. Uh, you also might use this if you're um, maybe a little high coming into final and you need to descend down to get to the glide path without gaining a bunch of airspeed. It's another good place for it. You can also adjust the steepness of the slip as necessary for the intending landing spot. So if we look back at this, oh, it's going to do that every time. So if we look back at this image here. By putting the nose further in whatever direction we're uh, pointing the nose, we then put more of the fuselage into the airstream and we will have more drag and descend more quickly. Should look forward to hearing tips on avoiding stalls while stopping. Okay, good. Sounds good. I will uh, make sure to put a special emphasis on that one. Um, the short version is you keep your airspeed up and then uh, and well away from the stall threshold. So when we're doing these forward slips to come into a landing, we're going to keep 65 knots just like we would uh, on our normal approach. And that gives us a nice, um, you know, 20, 25 knot buffer above our stall speed. So then we have plenty of room to work with. Uh, but just like every landing, it's, it's about keeping an eye on your airspeed indicator as you're doing this maneuver uh, to make sure that you're keeping enough airflow over the wings, staying, keeping lift, and then you know, not stalling. So, okay, so as uh, like I was saying for descent rate, you can change how steeply you're descending by changing how much the fuselage you're putting out into the, the airstream. And so by applying more rudder in the direction you want the nose to go, then you can kind of uh, increase the, the steepness or less rudder would then be less steep coming down. There is a practical limit on how much you can do that. So when your rudder is all the way to the floor, that is as far as you can point the nose for the forward slip. And so you can't put the fuselage out into the uh, airflow anymore, into the airstream anymore. And so that's as much drag as you can possibly generate. Um, we'll look at that while we're flying. You'll also see um, a couple of variations, but typically when we're slipping, we are trying to lose altitude. Um, let me say this differently. Although you can adjust the descent, the steepness of, of the descent, typically if you're going to be slipping on, for instance, a landing, you're slipping so that you can reacquire the glide path and then stabilize on that glide path. So it would be unusual to be using a forward slip without full rudder in. Depends on the situation, but typically we'll use full rudder, um, get that high drag configuration going, let the airplane come down, and then um, come back to a normal landing configuration. A couple of bits to be aware of with forward slips. The airspeed errors, um, the, uh, there are airspeed errors that occur with forward slips. I don't believe that they're going to be modeled in the sim and it would be really hard to figure out if they were modeled correctly um, but for a real aircraft it's important to know the reason that there are airspeed indicated airspeed errors um well let me, let me say this next sentence which is the airspeed errors depend on the number and location of static ports so it depends on how the aircraft is designed on what kind of errors you get <clears throat> So let me show you what I mean by that. So we haven't talked much about the uh, pedostatic system, although we will talk more about that in about two or three lessons. Excuse me, I'm gonna grab a little bit of water here. I can feel my voice getting raspy. All right. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about that in future lessons, but the important thing to know is that let me flip over to the um, sim, actually, and I can point these out in the simulator. So if I pop over here, the aircraft has this, uh, oops. Watching my Twitch uh, 
Oh, you know what's one thing that I should turn on? Hopefully that didn't uh, cause anything to quit out on the stream. Uh, I am turning on a, a MSI Afterburner to try and get a little bit more cooling to my GPU. I don't think that's the problem, but one of my experiments here. So, okay, so we're in the sim, we're looking at the aircraft, and you'll notice that on the, get that light on, but that's okay. There's the pitot-static system. And so the pitot, part of the pitot-static system is this pitot tube. And that's this guy. Let's change our camera speed here. It's fine. So the pitot part of the pitot-static is this pitot tube. And essentially, and, and so this is what measures our airspeed. And the way that it measures airspeed is by measuring the ram air that's coming in. So as we're flying, this is an open tube at the front. And the air from the, the airflow as it flows across the wing then creates ram air, air pressure, from just the air literally ramming into the pitot tube. And that amount of ram pressure gets then converted into a measurement of our, uh, our indicated airspeed. So the amount of um, the amount of uh, ram air coming into the pitot tube, if we're moving faster, we have more pressure in that ram air, and so the, uh, the airspeed indicator would go up. If we're moving slower, less ram air coming through, less pressure there, and the airspeed indicator would go down. The reason that there's the static part of the pitot static system is that it's not enough to just know how much pressure you have from ram air, you also need to know the ambient pressure. And so what is the static pressure, the kind of pressure without any ram factor to it of the air? So you have to have some baseline to compare that ram pressure to. Um, so let's say it's a really high pressure day, then the difference between the ram pressure and the pressure that is detected outside the aircraft, that gives you then your airspeed, the difference between the ambient pressure and the ram pressure. The way that we measure that ambient pressure, that static system, is through a small port on the side of the airplane. So in the sim, they have a place, they show where the port is, but they don't actually have a hole. So uh, in the center of this, in the real airplane, there would be a, oops, in the center of this, in the real airplane, there's a small hole. And that is the static measurement. So they put the static um, port somewhere where it's not going to have a lot of ram air where it can kind of measure the actual ambient pressure. So you can see as the air flows along the side of here where that uh, static opening is would just be able to, it would be able to measure kind of the actual ambient air pressure around. Okay, so to recap, we have our uh, pitot tube. Pitot tube measures the ram air pressure. The difference between the ram air pressure and the ambient air pressure gives us our airspeed. And our ambient air pressure is measured by a port right here. You'll notice that on this aircraft, there isn't a port on the other side. So the way that we measure static air, static air pressure, is through here. The reason this becomes important for our forward slips is if we go back, so remember it's on the left side of the uh, body of the aircraft. And so if we go back to our forward slip diagram here. If we are slipping the nose to the right, then we're putting the left side of the fuselage into the airstream. And that's actually creating some amount of ram air against that static port. So we have our pitot tube is measuring ram air as normal, but our static, our baseline reference, is going to have a higher pressure than it would otherwise. Because it has a higher pressure, that means that the difference between the higher static pressure, the difference between the ram air from the pitot tube and the ambient pressure from the uh, static uh, static port. I'm going to double check that's called the static port. I'm... Let me make sure that that's actually what that um, what that bit is called. But essentially, where that where the static uh, air pressure is measured. The difference between the ram air and that ambient air pressure is smaller 
because we have the fuselage put into the airstream. And so because it's smaller, our indicated airspeed reads lower, lower than it actually is, right? If we instead pointed the nose to the left, so in this diagram, it's pointing to the right, we have our static port is exposed to the airstream. If we point it to the left, static port would not be exposed to the airstream. And so we wouldn't expect to see much of a incorrect uh, measurement in airspeed. We might get some incorrect measurement because the uh, pitot tube, that tube that takes in ram air normally, is at an angle. And so maybe it'll read things a little off. Um, but we wouldn't have that same expectation of um, the static portion part of the system being uh, off, you know, notably. The important takeaway from that then is that the airspeed that you're seeing on the airspeed indicator is within sort of a margin of error of what the actual airspeed is. So in flying in at 65 knots, we already have a good margin of error on both sides before stall. So shoots to your question about avoiding stalls while slipping. Um, by staying at 65, we already have a pretty good margin of error. We don't want to get any slower than that, and we don't want to get any faster than that because especially if we're pointing the, uh, the nose to the right, so we're putting that left side of the fuselage into the airstream, if we're flying in at 65, because we know the airspeed indicator is reading low, we may actually be flying an actual airspeed of more like 75 or something. And so that's just a out of a hat number, not, not an actual difference of how much it is. Um, but it'd be some actual faster speed. And so when we go to then level off and flare, we may have a lot of airspeed coming into the runway and we may float. Um, so we really want to be holding kind of 65 as precisely as we can. All right, so to recap, side slips are used to keep the nose aligned with the uh, center line of the runway and also to keep the direction of movement of the landing gear aligned parallel so that we have no side loading when we touch down. A forward slip is used to put the fuselage into the airstream, create extra drag, allow us to sink more quickly. Both of them are cross-controlled and both of them have the relative wind coming at an angle, um, but their use cases and how they uh, are done are a little different. Um, one thing that may be useful for just remembering on it is the side slip is to help you move side to side along the runway. So if you were trying to keep aligned with the center line, side slip lets you do that side to side motion. The last thing I'll mention, so we talked about airspeed errors, that again depends on the number and location of static ports. Some aircraft have a static port on both sides of the fuselage, and so then it would read correctly no matter which way you point to the nose. Uh, just depends on the design. The last thing to know is you do need to check the POH for what they allow, what they allow for slips. For instance, uh, some POHs will say no slips with full flaps. Um, the Cessna 172 SP does not have that restriction, so we can do slips with full flaps if we'd like to. Um, another thing that you may encounter in the POH is um, warnings about, for instance, fuel ports. That's where we uh, put fuel in to fill the tanks. Um, about those coming uncovered in a forward slip or in a prolonged forward slip. So you might see limitations like you can forward slip, but you can only forward slip for a certain amount of time um, uh, or in certain configurations. So make sure you're checking your POH for what the specifics are on how to do a forward slip in that plane. And that's something, of course, as you're getting checked out in a new plane, um, so learning to fly for the first time with the CFI, they would also walk you through uh, the correct forward slip procedure. All right, let's get into actually flying the forward slip. So the first thing we're gonna do is reduce power to idle. The use case of the forward slip is to lose altitude without gaining airspeed. If our goal is to lose altitude, we shouldn't be adding more energy into that equation. And so we wouldn't be forward slipping with any power in because then it's sort of like, we're sort of like telling the plane to go faster, but then also trying to get high drag. It's like, you know, we're putting a bunch of engine power forward while also trying to get the plane to pull backwards. Um, so the first thing we want to do is reduce power to idle. Uh, we bank into the wind, if there's any wind, and apply opposite rudder to prevent the turn. So this is what this looks like. So back to the diagram here. So 
in this case, the relative wind is directly down the runway. If the wind was coming at an angle to the runway, we would lower the wing that's into the wind, lower that wing down, because that's what we're going to need to do for the actual landing in a side slip. You bank into the wind if there is any, and then apply opposite rudder to prevent the turn. So that's that cross control. We'll see when we go out and fly in a minute. Adjust bank angle to control glide path as necessary. Adjust bank and rudder to maintain runway center line. So the, well, we, we'll go out and see this, but essentially um, you're typically using full rudder, like I said, and then you're kind of adjusting your bank to make sure that you're staying aligned with the center line for that, for that full rudder. You wanna maintain the normal final approach indicated airspeed, again, depending on the static port locations. Uh, for us, we'll use that same 65 for both cases. Transition from forward slip to side slip or no slip before landing flare. So if you're uh, dealing with a crosswind, then you're gonna need to land in a side slip so that you don't put a bunch of load on the landing gear. And so that's why we bank into the wind so we can transition from a forward slip to a side slip. If there's no wind, then you may transition from a forward slip to just normal landing. We'll do a little bit of both of these today. And the last thing is to be aware, beware of excessive sink rate due to the forward slip. You wanna keep enough airspeed to round out and flare. So when you're throwing that fuselage into the airstream, you can get really draggy really fast. Uh, it's a great way to lose altitude, especially in uh, tail dragger airplanes. But if you're not paying attention to it, you can then uh, descend at a really, really rapid rate. Common errors, uh, high sp uh, speed control during the slip, excuse me, so you wanna make sure that you're keeping that airspeed. High sink rate in the flare. Um, you don't want to be descending uh, using that side slip all the way into the flare because that sink rate you have, then you're going to need to suddenly be like really aggressively rounding out, and that's not good for. Um, uh, that's not good because it'll potentially set you up for uh, stalling. Right, you have more load factor on the wings to do that aggressive round out. You may be stalling at a higher altitude, or I'm sorry, a higher airspeed than normal, um, and so you might have a, a pretty rough landing there. Failure to maintain stable forward slip, allowing bank and heading to wander. So remember, we want to keep our direction of motion aligned with the center line. And failure to go around if approach becomes unstable. So when we're doing this forward slip, if things don't look good, just like any landing, go around if, if you don't like the picture. All right, 30 minutes on the, well, a couple minutes over, but uh, basically 30 minutes, not so bad, despite our uh, snafu with forward slips. Let me make a note actually about Think of what's going on with that. Okay, and I'm still seeing quite a bit of fluctuation on the bandwidth here, and I don't quite know why that is. So let me know if it's distracting um, or if there's anything I need to repeat. I it seems like it's pretty transient, so um so I'm not gonna try and tackle it right now, but uh, but yeah, let me know if there's anything that, that would be useful to, to hear again. All right, so we're gonna go through the whole uh, stream has been so far. Okay, great, glad to hear it, Flying Turd. So let's go through the uh, whole start to finish, we'll do um, we won't do the pre-flight part, but we'll do everything from the, um, you know, so we've already done, I'm safe, our check our pilot, pre-flight our pilot. We've done our weather. We've done our, um, uh, pre-flight for like temporary flight restrictions and other information we gather. We're actually going to talk all about that in our lesson tomorrow, if I remember correctly. Um, so actually I can just look real quick. Yeah. So all of these required pre-flight actions, we're gonna get into this all tomorrow. Um, tomorrow also, just a heads up, is gonna be a two hour, tomorrow is Monday, um, will be a two hour ground session. So we will do a little bit of referencing the uh, sim to look at some things, but mostly we'll be talking about concepts um, on the ground. This would be like a great rainy day exercise or rainy day lesson, um, but uh, still really important information. So, so we're gonna say we've done all that and then we're gonna hop in the plane here and do our normal um, starting the engine, taxiing over, run up, we'll go and fly. Once we get in the pattern, then we'll do a couple of steep descents 
uh, I'm sorry, steep descents, forward slips. Um, and, uh, and then maybe play with some weather settings to kind of see. Uh, but I expect that we'll probably do maybe 30, maybe 45 minutes more uh, stuff today. So relatively short um, lesson. If we were out practicing with a student, this would be, you know, a day of just doing laps in the pattern and really practicing takeoffs, landings, um, forward slips, all those things. Um, at this point, then you would be really focusing on uh, airport traffic pattern work because you're prepping to fly solo. And so you want to make sure that you have all of those procedures down pat. You um, uh, feel really comfortable flying. The instructor increasingly doesn't need to do anything in the plane. They're just sort of hanging out. Um, so that's where we are. So far, nothing distracting. Okay, great. Great to hear shoots. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to switch over to VR then. And we're going to hope that uh, this audio thing continues to work pretty well. So give me just a second here. Okay. Oh. <laughs> That's new. Oh, I see what happened. Okay. I'm trying to get the uh, VR set up here. And um, apparently you can use a uh, drone mode in Microsoft Flight Sim in VR. I didn't know that. So I was trying to figure out why everything was looking wrong. And it was because I had, um, I was in drone mode. All right. Let's pop over to VR here. And actually, I'm going to go, um, oh, I have the iPad up. Great. OK. So I will try to do some amount of back and forth so you can see how I'm using my iPad through this um, takeoff prep. Um, and then apologies for the sort of mask on the face. It'll probably be obvious when I'm looking down and using my, my iPad. All right, so let's start going through. We have our pre-flight. So we said that we've done all of these things. Looked, we have the right amount of fuel. We have the right amount of oil. Um, all of our uh, movable parts are secure, but have freedom of movement. Nothing unusual. Windows are clean. This is something that um, you will forget once and then never forget again. So if you try to fly at sunset and the windows are dirty, it's a pretty obnoxious flight. Uh, not to mention sort of dangerous in that you often can't see aircraft around. Okay, so before starting engine, pre-flight inspection is complete. Passenger brief. Uh, might talk about the aircraft. Might talk about a sterile cockpit, especially for people I haven't flown with before. Um, one thing that we are required to talk about is seat belts and seats and seat belts and how to use the seat belts. Um, so just like in your commercial flying, if you go and fly at any major airliner, they're going to have you uh, do that whole safety brief. So that's all required. Uh, it's required for you as well as a, a private pilot. All right. Brakes test and set. Put my parking brake is on. Electrical equipment is off. Set my beacon I leave on. Oh. Avionics master switch off. Okay. Fuel selector valve is on both. Good. Fuel shutoff valve is on. I think this is a really interesting one with the sim is they often do have the fuel selector valve out, which I have never heard of someone who stores their plane like that. All right, let's call for the ATIS here. So. A call on my actual phone and I'll put it up to the speaker so we can all hear it. So I have live weather on here. We'll use the ATIS um, that we get from Palo Alto as our kind of official weather settings. Um, one thing to know is I still do have that add on which has the windsock in reverse. So if you see I'm looking out in the distance, I can see the wind according to the windsock is blowing uh, from maybe like 270 or so. Um, that windsock is 180 degrees off, so it should be, it's probably the wind is blowing from like uh, 09, like, uh, sorry, 090, basically directly east. Um, 
So just a reminder, because remember when we, we get the ATIS, we get the latest weather, but we also need to be looking at the indications that we're seeing on the airfield. So one of the big ones to check would be the windsock. Uh, it's frustrating that this windsock is 180 degrees off, but at least we know so we can account for it. Um, and of course, in the real world, that's like a physics thing, so it wouldn't happen. All right, here is the Palo Alto ATIS. Activity on and in the vicinity to Palo Alto Airport. Taxi Julia partially closed of the Taxi Sierra. Five zones in effect. I have to flood and place and contact flight service frequency. Please back a full store instruction to run road five minutes required. Five ground control of the park request. Provide dominant contact data information Romeo. Yeah, information of Romeo. All sound information of Romeo is 5147 Zulu, wind 0705. Visibility 10, sky clear, temperature 9, viewpoint minus 1, altimeter 3035, visual approaching, and an amplified memory 13. Red activity on and in the vicinity of the Palo Alto Airport, taxi duty at partially closed of the taxi Sierra. Five genomes in effect for hazardous loading place and contact flight service frequency. Please offer full short instructions and runway 5 minutes required. Back to All right, so sure enough, as we thought might be the case, the wind is coming from 0, 070 0 at 5, visibility 10, clear. Um, the altimeter setting I heard was 3035, which is a pretty high pressure system to be honest, but let's plug that in real quick. And it's 3035, and sure enough, that zeroes us out at the airport too, so it matches what we expect from the uh, airport elevation is essentially zero feet MSL. I think it's like seven feet, um, so that matches what we expect. They also said that Juliet is partially closed a beam Sierra. So my guess is gonna be from the rain that there's something going on here. And so when we think about anticipating where they're going to probably send us, they're probably gonna send us down uh, uh, Yankee terminal side, so they, we won't say Papa is where we start, but Yankee terminal side, and then Yankee 1, Zulu. Um, since they said that this area is closed, fortunately we're you know staying essentially in this area when we taxi, because we're going to come back probably on Juliet to Papa. Um, so for where we're parked today, it doesn't affect us, but good to know in case we ended up needing to go to uh, one of the hangars over here. Oops. All right, let's keep going on our checklist. Get the engine started. So let's see if I can angle this down enough that you can kind of see what's going on. So throttle one fourth inch. Mixture to idle cutoff, propeller area clear. So we're looking around, make sure it's clear. Oh, luckily passed right through that seat. All right, I'm a little low in the seat. Let me see if I can recenter this better. Okay, that's good. I'll fix that a little bit more when I actually get going, but of course we'd set our seat site before we get in the, the cockpit. Okay, propeller is clear, master switch on both sides. That one, flashing beacon is already on, good. So just to, to tell you what this looks like from the field too, I always mention that I keep this beacon on. Part of the reason that uh, I do that is when you walk away from the airplane, then you can turn around and look to see if the beacon, just to make sure the battery was turned off. Um, but if you look from the back side of the plane here, Maybe it's not modeling it. That seems wrong though. That's annoying. Why the other lights aren't working? I think I have no battery. That's pretty funny. Okay, obviously that would be a problem for actually flying. Um, I'm gonna turn my avionics on, see if it comes alive. No, okay. Huh. I wonder how they decided that. Maybe I left the battery running or something in the sim? 
haven't run into that before. Uh, okay, so let's go here. We'll restart. Make our life easy. Hello, I'll actually die in the sim if you're sitting too long. Really? That's pretty funny. I mean, that makes sense, I guess. It's just modeling the battery being drained. Although I think, I thought I had the battery off, but I don't know. Maybe I was doing something silly and didn't notice it. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> there you go. So that's why you turn the beacon on is so you can see it from a distance. Um, okay, so let's hop back in the plane. Um, if you turn this master on, there we go. Okay, we have lights. And then if we look from the back of the aircraft, you can see that red light blinking on top. Another reason that it's good to turn on the beacon at this point is then anyone who's walking around, maybe they're standing over here, um, if they see that beacon come on, they know you just turned your battery on. And so there's um, a reasonable indication that you're about to start the engine. Just one more safety precaution that you can take, um, make the airport a little safer for everyone. Try to get this to be the height I want. All right, that worked. Okay, let's keep going through. Auxiliary fuel pump on. Got to do this one. The same. So there's my fuel pump is on. Oh, I have to do all my preset up here too because I changed it all again. So make sure our fuel is on. Good. 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 Okay. Circuit breakers are all good. Okay. All right. So to prime the engine, we'll turn the fuel pump on. We're going to bring the mixture rich, and then we're looking for you know, three to four gallons, one, two, three, four, for about four seconds. And then we bring mixture to idle, turn off the fuel pump. Okay, so now we've got some fuel flowing in the system. We'll do the ignition switch to start, and then we will bring mixture in as soon as it catches. So at this point, I'll have the windows open and so we'll shout clear. We'll look around, see if anyone reacts. Okay. And then bring it to start. There it catches, bring the mixture in, and our ignition goes to full. Okay. And we want our power to be up at a thousand. Okay. Good. And then we bring our mixture back for taxi. Okay, as soon as we have the uh, engine going, we want to. Uh, one of the first things we do is look at our oil pressure, make sure oil pressure came up. Again, in the sim, it runs a little low, uh, which I don't love, but um, I think that's just a sim artifact. Oh, that's funny. Here's my altitude. It is a very high pressure day in the bay, actually. Okay, great. Pressure check, avionics master switch on. Oops, uh, okay, I'm trying to show this while also standing. There we go, okay. Radio is on. So now we go in here and we're gonna set this for our uh, ground frequency where we'll contact them, 125.0. Set this one for our tower frequency, 118.6. I also like to have the ATIS frequency bugged in the second one, although I usually call to get it. Um, it's nice to just have in case you want to leave the traffic pattern. Um, uh, a reason you may want to do that, for instance, so whenever we go flying, we have a plan for what we're going to do up flying. We don't just wing it. And so I realized what I said sounded a little wing it sort of energy and what I mean instead is that sometimes you'll be flying at Palo Alto and the plan for the day is to do traffic pattern work and when you get up there there's seven people in the traffic pattern it's super busy and you might say you know I'm going to fly down the road to San Carlos instead and do traffic there and so then you do your traffic pattern at San Carlos and then you come back to Palo Alto on the way back you'd want to get your new information so, uh, so that's sort of what I mean by that all right, uh, we don't need our ADF. Turn that off. We do need our transponder. One, two, zero, zero. Good. Okay. 
Protractor flaps already done. Headset, cancel and connect. Uh, you'll notice on my checklist that I have some things that I, uh, like my, this is my own personal checklist that I use for my own flying. So uh, that's why some of these things, like you wouldn't find noise cancel and connect maybe on a normal checklist. One of the advantages of customizing your own checklist is adding things like that. Mixture for taxi, we already did. Navigation lights on as required. So we'll turn on our lights for taxi. Oops, I see a message in the chat. I can look this here. Ah, flying turret headed, tie on an airliner as well. That's too bad. Gotta get that external power source plugged in. Hey. So our next checklist here will be our before takeoff checklist. So we're gonna call for uh, Palo Alto ground and ask for our taxi instructions. So again, I'm ready to write this down. And so I'd say something like Palo Alto ground, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra on Papa with uh, Romeo for right close traffic with the option. And so uh, Palo Alto Ground is going to respond with something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, Sierra Taxi Runway 13 via Yankee Terminal Side, Yankee 3 Zulu is probably what they're going to say. Um, and um, they may say something else like hold short Yankee 3 or something like that for switching over to the tower frequency. Um, in fact, I think. I think they'd have me stay with ground all the way through to the run-up area, though. So we'll do it that way. Uh, okay, so then I'd say that back to them. Um, taxi to runway 13 via Yankee Terminal side, Yankee 3 Zulu, uh, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. Okay, and then I can hop onto my map here and draw what that is. So Yankee Terminal side is this. They're saying taxi down this way, taxi Yankee 3, taxi on Zulu, all the way up to the uh, run-up area to here. So relatively straightforward taxi instruction. So I'll leave that up for the actual taxi, although I'm going to be in VR for it. All right, last look for questions. OK, great. Um, let me move my iPad so it's not in my way. I could use my kneeboard, I suppose. That's exactly what it's for. Set this. Okay, uh, always makes me so uncomfortable. There's a, a guy standing there for the add-on, but that's right. So the first thing we do, apply the brakes down here, take off the parking brake, and then we just wanna give enough throttle that we start moving forward. And we do have some wind coming from 070, which is actually directly uh, right crosswind right now. Uh, so I'll deflect my ailerons off to the right. Just enough power here to get going. Okay, great. And then we test the brakes. Good, brakes work. Might have your CFI test his brakes, his or her brakes. And then pull straight out. Excuse me, bud. Looking for traffic on Papa. Okay, good. And still have our right headwind, so our wind correction is like this. Looking for traffic coming down. Traffic in the direction we're going, okay. Good. Also checking my instruments as I taxi, so I wanna make sure my heading indicator is showing the directions I'm expecting, uh, matches my magnetic compass. Uh, I'll look at my turn coordinator down there and see that the aircraft is deflecting how I expect. Okay, looking for another aircraft, keeping that yellow line in the center of the aircraft. If you want to check your alignment, you can put your head in the middle of the aircraft and you'll see. Um, but it basically is, if your right foot feels like it's over the line, then you are um, aligned with where you need to be. Forgot to do my 
wind correction here. So let me get that set up correctly. The backwards uh, wind sock reminding me. This is one of those um, sim artifacts that I'm really torn about this backwards windsock because I think it's uh, honestly really dangerous to be developing a habit that includes checking a windsock that looks in reverse of what it should because we do want to check the wind on the field. We do want to be accounting for it and getting used to a picture where the windsock is blowing as though it's a tailwind is, is really bad. I mean, it, you want to be taking off into a headwind, and if I saw that uh, windsock when I was actually out flying, I would say I need to go from the other runway because um, this is you know, at least five knots wind coming that way. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I make a big point of it every time because I think it's it's one of those things that I I would worry about if you're using the same add-on as me. Um, it's a pretty pretty bad thing. Um, okay, so. In the instructions that we got, they said to taxi all the way to uh, one three. They didn't tell us to hold short at Yankee three, so taxi onto here. And as we this way for the win, and then as we come back this way, then we again collect our ailerons for the win. Good. The green area over there is, uh, you can think of it as like fake grass, meaning it's supposed to indicate that you're not supposed to take your aircraft on it. Um, but the materials used uh, may not be able to support the weight of your aircraft is the reason to not do it. Um, so. Here we go, a little bit off of the yellow line. Taxi speed's a little fast. It's supposed to be a walking speed. And the other thing to keep in mind is I have a tailwind right now, and so a tailwind will actually push me along too. Um, so it may be that even if I have the right uh, throttle RPM setting set for my normal taxi, I'm still gaining speed just from that wind. Okay, we got our three run-up area uh, T-bars here. So we'll taxi in, no one else in the T-bars. Whenever I'm using the brakes, power's already at idle, so power's at idle. A little off to the T-bar, but that's okay. Straighten this nose wheel, make sure that we aren't. Side it all here. Oop. All right, there we go, good. And we have a, uh, it's kind of a directly to our left wind, so I'll keep holding my wind correction here. Whenever we stop, we want to be at 1,000 RPM. Get back up to 1,000. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to be kind of going in and out of VR to use my checklist here. One thing, parking brake. All right, parking brake set. Passenger seat backs are in the most upright position. Oops. Oh, haha. <laughs> um, Oh, that explains some things. I, I had my, anyway, I, I had my desk uh, pulled out from the wall slightly, and so um, some of my angles are off in a weird way. Cabin doors are closed and lock, uh, so you go check them out, and then you might also push on the door a little bit, make sure it's closed. Flight controls free and correct, so we are going to box our flight controls, bring them all the way out. This, all the way back in. Good, okay, so they are free and correct. And then we go, oh, they are free, and now we can check correctness. So when I point them toward that aileron, the aileron should go up, sure enough it does. The one on the other side's down. If I go the other direction, the one I'm pointing to should go up, and the other one is down, good. And bring our wind correction back in. Um, oh, I throttle a little bit there. You can also check 
three and correct in the same motion. You don't have to do them as two separate activities if you don't want. Um, I like to because I like to just focus on the one at a time. Flight instruments check and set. Flight instruments look good. I'm going to set my heading indicator to our uh, runway heading. Our heading indicator matches our magnetic compass. Good, good. Uh, attitude indicator is level with horizon. Okay. Fuel quantity check. Good, so we have 13, 26 gallons total, 13 each. That's plenty for today. Mixture rich. And now we're doing our um, run up. So mixture rich, we bring in throttle to 1800. And then check our left magneto, drop of 100, bring it back, check our right magneto, drop of 100, good. So they are within our threshold for difference between them and also within our maximum drop. Check our vacuum is good, amps are good. Scan my checklist here, make sure there's nothing else. Okay, check our enunciator panel. Okay, all the lights come on as expected. And let's check our throttle at idle to make sure the aircraft idles okay. Okay, looks good. It's at a reasonable idling speed. Bring that back up to a thousand. Throttle friction is good. Heading indicator is set. Strobe lights is desired. Oh, I did not turn my lights on for taxi. Okay, those are good. Radio avionics set, set. Nav GPS switch. So if we're gonna use our uh, navigation system, we'll use the GPS mode for it. Uh, we could use our navigation mode if we wanted to do VOR navigation. Check our autopilot. So we already know in the sim that this doesn't work how a, a normal autopilot would, but if we turn on our autopilot and then set it to go to the heading, we should expect the vehicle to turn. Good, so it's turning to the right because we have our heading bug is off to the right. That's correct. Now we should be able to overpower it. I'm grabbing my yoke in the real world uh, and it is not doing anything, so that would be a no-go, uh, of course. Um, in the real world though, there's a motor that you're essentially trying to make sure you can overpower. Um, we should be able to disengage it, so we'll check our disengage methods. We have a autopilot disengage there, good. Re-engage this, put it back in heading mode. We can turn it off here, good. Uh, and then the last one, if we ever needed it, we could auto or disengage at the um, uh, circuit breaker here. This one is sort of like a button in. Most of the ones that I've seen have something you could actually grab and pull out. Which would be like a last a last case in an emergency. Nano electric trim, make sure that it's all trimmed up. Okay, so I'm using my trim on my yoke and it's working. Trim for takeoff. Takeoff brief. Okay, so every time we do a takeoff brief, if we uh, have not got to 70% of our airspeed. 40 knots by the time we get to halfway through the runway, uh, which is going to be our, show it on here. Uh, bra or really we should, we can use Charlie. Bravo is okay, it's about halfway, but um, if we haven't got to 40 knots by the time we get to Charlie here, we're gonna abort our takeoff. We are not gathering the speed we expect. We abort our takeoff, we'll power at idle, uh, get on the brakes, slow down, taxi off the runway, figure out what's going on. If we have taken off, or if we don't have enough runway to stop, then we will take off and we'll pitch for best glide, uh, 60 with the flaps. Um, so we'll use 10, not, or 10 degrees of flaps, and we will fly the aircraft into a nice landing just straight ahead on the runway. If we're up at traffic pattern altitude of 1,000 feet, then uh, we will turn back to the runway, uh, pitch for best glide, turn back to the runway, and land on a reasonable spot. If there's time in the air, then we might try a restart flow or we might try some other things. Uh, but the most important thing, if 
an emergency develops while we're this close to the ground is uh, aviate, right? Aviate, navigate, then communicate. Most important thing is to aviate. So fly the airplane, focus on our best glide, focus on a good landing. Okay. Wing flaps to 10. And release our brakes. Okay, let me get our iPad set up here so you can see the traffic pattern as we do it. I have this marked point here. I don't really want it, but that's all right. There we go. Okay, let's go fly. So we know that we have five knots uh, at 070. So our runway heading is 030. So that means that we're 60 degrees off of runway heading uh, and it's 60 degrees off to the left. So we have a left crosswind when the crosswind is 60 degrees or more, that is essentially the same as having all of the wind coming as a crosswind. So we expect about five knots crosswind, assuming nothing has changed in the wind since we got our ATIS. Uh, that's, I guess, all for that. So wind is 070, our runway is 130, 60 degrees off. 100% of that then comes as a crosswind. So that's five knots of crosswind we're expecting, which also means when we take off, we're gonna be using left aileron uh, deflection and then feeling out how much we need to do a nice takeoff from just one wheel. Same thing as in our landing, we're trying to avoid side loading the landing gear. So we're um, just keeping the aircraft pointed down the runway in that same sort of side slip uh, configuration. Uh, one other thing, when we're taking off from 1.3, we haven't done that uh, yet, I don't think, but we don't have that noise abatement deviation. So we'll just maintain runway heading all the way through um, with our slight crab angle for uh, wind. I right, want to make sure everything's good on my side here. Feels good. Feels like I'm slightly off center, but um, that'll work out here. Okay. Last questions in the chat. Okay. Yep. A couple. Let me see. Yeah, Schutz is saying about the threat of the nose uh, getting stuck in soft soil uh, if it sinks in when you go over like dirt or soil. Yep. Um, one advantage of a tail dragger, exactly. Um, when we talk about soft field technique too, we'll talk about uh, keeping weight off of the nose wheel and how we do that. So we, for a uh, tricycle gear aircraft like this one where the nose wheel, uh, we have a landing gear in front instead of on the tail, to avoid that sort of digging in, we use elevator pressure backwards and kind of keep weight off of the wheel. So we'll talk about how to do that to avoid that kind of situation. But, but yeah, if the ground is uh, really muddy or there's a high likelihood of just sinking in, um, you can nose over in, in an airplane like this. All right, well, let's go. So. Call up Palo Alto Tower, Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, run up complete. They'd say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. Oh, switch over to tower frequency. Do this right. And then they'll say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, uh, taxi up to hold short 13. Say taxi up to hold short 13. Look for traffic coming down, just make sure we're not about to pull out into anyone. And then. Parking brake off, and we can start our taxi here. Now we have some crosswind that we're accounting for, so we'll use a little bit of wind correction. Good. Essentially, we're coming up to the yellow line and then recapturing that yellow line taxiing along. It is not unheard of to just go directly to the full position markings and not regain the yellow line. I think it's good practice to always navigate off of this yellow line. Um, so I would encourage that. Okay, and a thousand feet anytime we stop, or a thousand RPM anytime we stop. Excuse me. So there we go. And mixture for taxi. Okay, and we're waiting here. Maybe we got some traffic landing, so we'd be listening to the radio, and they'll give us some clues sometimes. Either 
by who's getting cleared to land and where they are in the traffic pattern, or else they might say something like, you know, three, P, uh, three aircraft landing ahead of you or something like that. Uh, eventually, they might say something like, Sesta Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, line up and wait, one three. Say, line up and wait, one three, Sesta Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. So what they've told us to do then is we are now approved to cross the threshold here. And so as soon as we cross, we do lights, camera, or before we cross, lights, camera, action. So lights, that landing light on, camera, we have our transponders good, and then action, trim is set, mixture rich, and So my uh, iPad's audio actually comes through, which I'm realizing then you guys probably can't hear that, but at least you can see the callouts from it. Sorry about that. Okay, so we wouldn't stop here, but um, I realized there's a problem with how I set up my audio. Okay, so wind is now over right headwind, taxiing out, lights, camera, action, good. Checking for traffic as we taxi out, just to make sure the tower didn't miss something. And I like to use the whole runway, so we'll go all the way back up to the beginning here and then get lined up for takeoff. We'll just line up right on the center line. Yeah, man. I thought we'd need. All right, wind's coming from over here. Uh, and then we'd wait here for the tower to tell us to take off. It'd probably be momentarily. Um, usually it's like someone just taking off. So, say Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, uh, clear for takeoff, 1-3, left close traffic. So clear for takeoff, 1-3, uh, left close traffic. Up Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, bringing in full power over the course of four seconds. Staying aligned with the center line. My heels are on the floor now, so I don't have my feet uh, hovering over the brakes. And then I'm feeling out the amount of wind correction I need. Airspeed's alive. There's our 40 we're looking for, good. And then I'm taking it onto just one wheel just to correct for the wind and roll at 50. Okay, rotate at 50, excuse me. Now we're looking to climb out at BY. And we know that our wind is from the left, so we're going to need a little bit of crosswind or crabbing to the left. There's BY, good. At 200, we can bring in, bring up our flaps, maintain our VY attitude. Okay. Good. You can actually hear those clicks or me sort of adjusting my trim. Okay, good. And I could look behind me to see if I'm aligned with the uh, runway. Kind of hard to see in the sim, but. All right, looking into my left wing, 30 degree banks for our traffic pattern. See where we're going, good. And, oops. 800 feet on this side, so I have climbed over my traffic pattern altitude, so let's get back to 800 where we're supposed to be. There's our crosswind, 800 feet, and we'll go 2,000 RPM. Again, uh, coordinated turn as we go in, so we need left and left uh, rudder, left aileron for bank, 30 degrees. Climbed up a little bit here still. Great. Okay, there's 800. Get parallel to the runway. Okay, good. We're a little close, although this is probably okay. So 2,000 RPM we want on the downwind here. We we'll do our gums check, gas, good. Undercarriage welded and our brakes work. Mixture is rich. Uh, prop is fixed. Uh, we have a fixed prop in this plane always, so if it was a constant speed prop, we'd have another knob we're adjusting. Uh, switches are all on, good, and seatbelts. So we have our seatbelts, good. Okay, I'm gonna be at 800 feet. I'd like to get to my traffic pattern altitude properly. Okay, a beam, our touchdown point. We bring our power back to 1600. We said we're gonna use 1600 and 10 degrees of flaps. Let the airplane come down at 80 knots. Looking for traffic that might be entering on the base leg here. I'm getting blown a little bit inland just from that crosswind, so I should be crabbed out a bit. Okay, and I'm looking for 80 knots. Okay. 
Good, once we get to 45 degrees away from the landing point, we'll turn our base leg, 30 degrees bank, coordinated aileron and rudder, looking for 70 airspeed, although our RPM stays, our throttle stays the same, and we want 20 degrees flaps, so our prop flaps down. Okay. Under rotated there. Okay. Attempting my wind correction angle, I worry I may be a little overcorrecting, but that's all right. Turning on to final, rolling into 30 degrees. There's 65 knots, and we're doing just a normal landing here just to warm up, uh, which I should have called out on downwind. So there's my white and red, that's good. I'm a little slow, so I pitch for airspeed, power for altitude. So I'm letting my nose come down, and I've added more power, let myself um, try to hold this 200 altitude until I get and I'll land on that third runway stripe, which is where the uh, glide path is. A little slow still. All right, I don't like that picture, so let's do a go around. So full power, flaps to 20, accelerate to VY, climb out, we'll go 10 degrees of flaps. As we hit VY, positive rate of climb. And then just like normal, we need a little right rudder. Just like normal, it gets 200, we can bring out Right, cram, cool, call, or I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> cram, cool, sorry, <laughs> sorry, cram, climb, cool, configure, call. So cram, we put the throttle forward, climb, we're already climbing. Uh, cool, we don't need to do in this plane, configure, we have our flaps are up, and call. So let's say Cessna, uh, call up to tower, Cessna, Apollina, Tango, and Sierra, going around. They wouldn't mind that. Um, they probably would have approved us for landing with the options, so we could have done our 800 feet AGL and we want 2,000 RPM and we're going to do our crosswind turn here looking for traffic okay and we can roll out on our heading get a little bit of altitude nice crosswind leg might need a little bit more crowding in here okay let's turn downwind again 30 degrees staying coordinated through the turn too much left rudder. So one of the other things that you develop in your early hours of flying is a feeling for what coordinated flight feels like. Um, and I heard a description yesterday that I thought was pretty, uh, honestly kind of funny, but also really good, which is uh, essentially what you're feeling for. So I'm gonna angle myself away from the runway just a little bit here for a crab. Uh, essentially what the, all right, we're trying to multitask too much here. So this is where um, best to focus on your traffic patterns. So do a gums check, gas undercarriage mixture, prop and seatbelt switches, 800 feet. As we get a beam, our landing point, which we'll use the runway threshold there. Actually our landing point we've been using is our, um, the, or the, the glide uh, glide slope indicator. So I should be using that for when I bring out power. I'm looking for 80 on the airspeed, so I'll pitch down just a little bit. 1600 RPM, 10 degrees of flaps. Okay. Turn onto base. Again, we're looking for traffic where we turn and around the turn, looking for 70 knots here and 20 degrees of flaps. Staying coordinated. Okay, and we wanna roll out on a nice base leg here. Coordinated rollout. Angled in a little bit towards the runway for our wind correction. All right, now we can roll into our final, looking for 65 knots. Full flaps. And I can already see that I'm a little low on the glide slope, so I'm going to bring in power to hold this altitude until I recapture the glide path. I want to be at 65 knots for that, so there's 65 knots. Holding the glide path. After holding altitude, there's glide path. So now I'm bringing power to 1600 and 65 knots. Get a little bit more power here. Okay, now we have a little bit of left crosswind that we're expecting so 
There you go. Now my aiming point is the uh, beginning of the second stripe there. You can see it growing in the windshield, still holding good 65. Bring our power to idle as we cross the threshold. Round out looking at the middle of the runway and then the end of the runway. Okay, so that would have been some side loading in that I was drifting left and right as we were landing. Um, but uh, okay, sort of sim landing here. One thing that I'm noticing is the windsock that was originally five knots at 070 is now not flying at all. Um, okay, so come back to the end of the runway here. So we might have had our local wind change. Again, that's one of the indicators I'm looking for. Get on this yellow line. Good. And once we are clear of three or one three, excuse me, I'll taxi a little bit further so we can give some aircraft some space. And let's do our cleanup flow. So every time we stop, thousand RPM. Then we do our trim for takeoff, our uh, mixture for taxi, flaps to ten, and then uh, lights over here. So it's sort of a pattern that I'm doing. I'm going from the bottom up to the right and across to the left. A flow, you might hear it called. So this is interesting in that we originally set our altimeter and we were at zero uh, AGL, I'm sorry, zero MSL on our altimeter, which is what we expected. So that's now gone up by 20 feet. Um, so I'm gonna guess that we are a little bit low on our, like we should maybe be 33, 30, I'm sorry, 30, 37, that's gonna be my guess. I'm sorry, 30, 33. Um, but we can get the latest Altim or uh, ATIS, or they would also announce it on the radio. Um, and then we also have updated wind, um, which it looks like we just have no wind now, so that's not necessarily bad. Uh, last thing we do is then do our uh, landing checklist. So we pull out our checklist and take a look and see if there's anything else we need to do. Do that real quick here. Wing flaps are up. We use them 10 degrees for our next round takeoff, but if we were not being done, then we would do that. Mixture lean for taxi. It's done. Elevator trim set. Lights is required. Flight plan closed. You don't have a flight plan. Okay. Do a little debrief on this pattern. It looks like I was flying, so we wanted between a half mile and a mile away from the runway, so I was about a half mile. To go a little further out would be nice. Um, this leg was real off, so it should be a nice square pattern here, um, and both times I was angled out some. Um, I think my thought process was I need to crab, but I think I was just crabbing too much for what the wind actually was. And then these ones are kind of not not a nice clean flat edge. I would, I would hope to see a little bit more clean flat edge. Flying a little further out, uh, maybe a three fourths of a mile would give me more time on both crosswind face. So I think I'll do that uh, next time we go around. Also going to demonstrate the forward slip, which is the main thing that we're working on today. Um, seems like our wind has died. Uh, but let's go back to runway 13 and we'll do another one like that. And this time we'll do uh, right traffic. We'll go up to the pattern altitude of 1000 AGL because um, we're going to be inland. And then we'll do a forward slip. So to do a forward slip, we're just going to hold our altitude through until we get to final and then slip it out. All right. So here we go. Uh, so tower would tell us something pretty much right when we get off about um, you know, uh, taxi back Zulu each time advise um, on termination or something like that. Okay, don't want to get going too fast here. So it's pretty interesting flying in the sim with live weather because it's always a little hard to tell 
what the sim is going to do well or do poorly or what's going to feel realistic or not. Um, but when you're flying at a real airport, you do have localized wind things that'll just happen. And so when you're coming into land, sometimes you need to just account for what is actually happening right at that moment at, at the airport. So for instance, as I was coming into land, I was seeing the windsock had no wind indicated. And essentially looking at that going, okay, well there's whatever wind we had when we left has now died. And so I probably can land just straight ahead like normal without any side slip. Uh, but when we got in close to the ground, it became apparent that I was getting pushed uh, along the runway. And so I actually did need some side slip to account for that. Um, didn't go great. I ended up with some side loading because my side slip was not evenly down the runway. Um, but, uh, but that's the idea with it. Actually, you know what, now that we're looking at that, let's do, not only are we gonna do a forward slip for this one, but let's do a side slip and let's plan to not land this next one. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a forward slip to lose altitude. And then when we get above the runway, uh, maybe like 100, 200 feet or so, um, we'll switch to a side slip and then we can slip back and forth across the runway to show what that's supposed to look like as far as the nose staying aligned with the center line. Okay, so they might say something like, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango is here, clear for takeoff, runway 13, right close traffic. We'll say, clear for takeoff, 13, right close traffic. Lights, camera, action. So lights, camera is good, action. Our trim is set, mixture rich. Uh, flaps are set, and we are good to go. Uh, lights, camera, action, time. So we'll say, uh, so it's, what, 12, 26, that's good. Let's get rolling, come on. There we go. Okay, so clearing the traffic pattern as we approach it, we wanna make sure there's no one coming in to land that tower uh, isn't aware of or they're just doing something silly. Um, and so, okay, as we come in here, lined up with the center line. There we go, lined up with center line and bring in full power over four seconds, three, four. And we're gonna need some right rudder to stay aligned with the center line. So we're kind of dancing on the pedals, if I've heard it called, kind of like, so just doing as needed. Um, we don't have any wind anymore, so we aren't using any wind correction on our ailerons, which is fine. And then 55, we rotate and we're climbing out at our VY angle let the aircraft accelerate to match that. Okay, there's VY. Uh, because we don't have any crosswind, now I'm just holding my runway heading on the heading indicator. So you can see I'm flying out at 130, match the runway. 200 feet, raise our uh, flaps. Hold our VY angle, good. Okay. Looking good, 700 feet, we can start our turn onto the crosswind, do coordinated roll in, 30 degrees bank, I'm looking around, make sure I'm not going to be turning into anyone, continue to climb, come up to 900 feet, we're going to 1000 for traffic pattern altitude, there is our 90 degree crosswind, 50 before 1000, we bring power to 2000, level off here. We'll line up with the highway for our spacing. Give yourself some nice room. So again, looking for traffic, rolling into a turn here. Up 2,000 RPM. Now this feels a little far from the runway, but, um, but that's okay. So for the forward slip to landing, we're gonna hold 1,000 feet and we're just gonna stay at this altitude. I wonder if I should take off. Uh... So the the aircraft seems to want to go back and forth quite a bit, and I'm wondering if there's something about live weather is saying there's a a layer of turbulence here. Um, not unheard of for a bowl shaped valley like the the bay is. All right, so looking at the runway, I'm expecting it to be about halfway up my strut. Looks pretty good. Thousand feet. Okay, good. So normally we would then be uh, flaps 10 and bringing back power. We're gonna keep our power here. Um, 
Actually, you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, we're gonna do that same start to it. So we'll do 1600 and flaps 10 to start slowing down. Um, but we're gonna maintain uh, altitude. So instead of starting to descend, we'll just uh, back here, good. 1600, okay. Coming up on 45 degrees, there's 45. Watching my airspeed closely here as we do this turn. Um, I'm going to bring 2,000 RPM. I don't like the low speed. Because what I'm doing to maintain that altitude then is I'm pulling back in the elevator. And if you're pulling back in the elevator, you could cause it to stall. Okay. So still pretty high here. That's good. Kind of a short base leg. All right, let's go 1600. We'll start coming down for our descent. So we're looking for 65 knots on base. We bring in 20 degrees of flaps. All right, so now we're looking at this going, wow, we're really high here. So first thing we do is bring out power. Don't wanna be adding power to a situation here. 65 is what we're looking for on our airspeed. We don't wanna be crosswind, so we can um, put either wing down just fine. And essentially what's gonna happen here is, you notice that I have white over white, so I'm really high on this runway. So I'm turning my normal uh, base to final turn just to get lined up with the center line. And then I am using left rudder to put the nose to the left and right aileron to keep the nose or the airplane aligned with the center line. And then I'm watching my airspeed carefully to make sure that I'm not uh, getting slower than 65. Okay, so you can see my nose is off to the left, my wings are off to the right. On a real 172, you can actually forward slip quite a bit more aggressively than this. This doesn't feel quite like the nose angle I'm expecting. Okay, and then as we come to about 100 AGL, let's transition to a side slip. So again, wing low, but we're keeping our nose pointing down the center line. I'm gonna add some power so we can go back and forth here. So here's, oops, I don't know, I'm getting a little slow. Okay. So using our power just to keep ourselves flying here, and then we're using rudder to keep ourselves aligned with the center line. It's not, uh, not my greatest performance ever. All right, let's go around here. That's a good example of like uh, practicing this in the real world, never that low. Um, but uh, in the sim, sort of going, oh, it's the sim, but uh, it's not, not a good example, so. So let's climb out, flaps 10, look past 200, possible way to climb, VY, so we'll go flap zero, and we'll do another round around here. Okay, keep our runway heading and 700 feet, look under our wing, turn to the right, 30 degree bank to establish the turn. Staying coordinated. We got 50 feet to 1,000. Okay, so 50 feet before, bring our power to 2,000, start leveling off. Nice crosswind here. Level off that much. Okay. So it's a nice base. I don't know how it's showing up in um, uh, the stream. It feels a little more stuttery today than the past few days. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, I think I have the same basic setup, but that's right. We'll uh, we'll make do. Okay, two thousand, holding our thousand feet AGL, and we'll keep doing that through. I'm actually going to pause here and uh, turn off. Uh, live weather because the uh, whatever's going on at this altitude is uh, more distracting than helpful. Uh, 
Okay. And while we're here, let's put in a little bit of wind. So we're coming in on runway one three. We can go. Uh, let's put a runway or a wind of uh, one zero zero. So it'll be a left crosswind at thirty degrees off of runway heading. And so if we are thirty degrees off, that means half of it will be experienced as crosswind. So we can put our wind speed to maybe eight knots. So we have a four knot crosswind now, and a little bit of a headwind. Uh, we can turn our gusts. Off. All right, let's see how that looks. Okay. That should work. Back to VR. Keep flying. down to a thousand. Oh, because I have my um, altimeter setting is incorrect, so that needs to be back to uh, standard. So that's why it's important to set your altimeter, is we would have been 300 feet off uh, above that. Okay, so back at a thousand. Feels good AGL. Holding 2,000 feet RPM, but I will bring in 10 degrees of flaps. My airport here. As soon as I put in flaps, it has a pitching up moment on the nose, so I gotta retrim. Good. Okay, looking for traffic that might be coming in uh, on final or uh, just what's around not paying attention. All right, so that's about 45. Turn in, coordinated, rudder and aileron to enter the turn. On our base leg, we'll do 20 degrees of flaps. Done our gumps check already, do it on downwind every time. Okay, square off, and we know that we have a little bit of a headwind, so we'll need to crab in just a little bit to keep that. Part of the reason I chose a left headwind is that we're then gonna use left uh, wing down into the wind and you can see how we transition to a side slip. All right. So I bring out power here. We'll start doing our turn to final. And I'm looking for 65 knots. So as we turn to final, we bring in full flaps. Remember in this aircraft we can slip full flaps. Of some aircraft that's not allowed. You can see, even without the slipping, just because we have a headwind and I don't have any power in, we're already losing altitude more rapidly than normal. Um, so I'm getting myself my trim set for 65. Uh, in fact, I'm probably losing too much altitude for what I want to demonstrate. So I'm going to bring in power again and hold off level here, 65 knots. We get to the center line. Okay, great. So now let's do the forward slip. So we're crabbing for the center line, and we want 65 knots in our airspeed, right rudder, full deflection, and our left aileron is down, our left wing to keep ourselves aligned with the center line. Okay, that's probably all the forward slip we need. In fact, we're below glide path now, so we want to come back and make sure we're on the glide path. We do have that left crosswind though, so we'll need to do a side slip as we come into land. So. 60 knots for 65, this is okay. So you'll notice I have, using my right rudder to keep myself aligned with the center line. Don't want any lateral drift. Okay, there we go. And my let my right uh, wheel actually just touched. So I was actually holding uh, just on the left wheel for most of that landing then. I'd be better to have landed directly on the center line, but um, we'll take that. Now remember when we start to roll out then, we increase our aileron deflection to account for the wind, so windsock is uh, lying to us again, because it should be wind blowing towards us, so keep that in mind. Um, okay, and then we can taxi off. Of course, we could catch an earlier exit than the end. We don't have to leave from the end. Um, okay. 
But I hope that's sort of useful. Um, I think, let me see if there's any questions. Uh, let me properly taxi off the runway because stopping here will get you in trouble. Um, what I think I'm gonna do is slew the airplane back to maybe 1,500 or so uh, on final, just so that we can see the descent rate and I can get a little bit more time to establish that slip, uh, sort of show you it. Um, this has a lot of the same sorts of um, aerodynamics issues that I was running into with spins where like, it just doesn't quite feel right uh, in some pretty important ways. Um, all right, so we got our wind correction in here aligned with our taxi and then we can stop and do cleanup. Probably don't want to stop right in front of the Yankee one. Sorry for this. Uh, cleanup flow, so we reset our trim, make sure to taxi, flaps to two degrees, and turn off our landing light. And then we grab our checklist and run our finger over the checklist. Go back here. Double check we've done everything. Okay, good. Okay, so let's slew back. Um, and I will go from a little bit higher height. We can actually see um, sort of the whole uh, getting into the side slip more and actually holding it a little longer so you can see what that drop looks like. I think this will work okay. That's not very much fun. Sorry, slew. <laughs> so don't slew your aircraft into straight up and down. Let me make sure that it actually starts in a flyable position. That's a little fast, but that's okay. should be okay. Right, we've got live weather again, so we got a little bit of that upper air turbulence, but that's all right. So actually let's set that back so we can look at the, um, Right, that'll work. Slow up a little bit higher. Okay. Altitude. All right. Always fun in the sim, huh? So first thing I'm doing is power to idle. And then I can establish, I want to drop my downwind wing into the wind, rudder full right, so I have my full right rudder in. If I pop outside the airplane, you can see I'm holding it like that. And then I'm just using my bank angle to keep aligned with the center line. Now I'm a little bit to the right of center line. I'm also going pretty fast, so I want to get going a little slower, so I'll pitch my nose up. 
And now I'm coming, now I'm more or less on center line. I just need to use just the right amount of bank to get there. Still too high here. Now slipping out a thousand on what is this 500 feet to go is uh, kind of aggressive, but uh, not impossible actually. So our 65, holding that nice right align with the center line, I'm coming down. Now I don't have any flaps in, which I should have done first, so we'll put in 10 degrees of flaps, 20 degrees of flaps, and then go full flaps. So we'll need to adjust our pitch to keep flying. Flaps, of course, add additional drag, and so that's part of how we can descend quickly enough. Still holding full right rudder and just keeping the ailerons deflected to the left. Okay, so, so that's all there is to it. Now notice that my uh, coordination, my ball is off to the left. So that's an indication this is a uh, cross-controlled maneuver. So again, if we were to stall here, this is where we could have a risk of a uh, spin. Uh, we started, what, 2,000 feet above, held this forward slip at 65 all the way down to the runway. Um, and we're going to land a little long, so we won't land this one because we want to land it first. Uh, third of the runway, uh, but not so bad for, for a maneuver like that. So then, of course, we're going to switch from this to a side slip, bring the nose to just enough rudder to parallel the runway, and then we use the ailerons to keep ourselves uh, moving directly down the wind. So, all right, let's go around. Full power, 20 degrees flaps. Two hundred, bring up full flaps. All right. So there we go. I think that's as good a point as any to uh, pause for today. Let me pop over into my OBS here, and we'll close out the discussion. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I I think the last demonstration of the forward slip is a little bit more clear of what you're looking for in that you have this sort of um, full rudder being applied and then uh, using your ailerons to kind of keep yourself aligned with the center line and you can come down. And you notice that we were at, what, 2,000 feet AGL with like 500 feet to go or something and we were able to steepen our descent really, really aggressively. Um, one thing that I forgot to do uh, in the reset was to actually use my flaps. So of course, we in that kind of situation, we're trying to descend as rapidly as possible. And so flaps are a key part of that, increase our drag. Um, other than that, let's close out here so we can kind of debrief on the last two legs. I really like my crosswinds here. I thought were really clean. The turn to downwind was a little bit uh, not parallel. So I was angled out a little bit more. I should have been ground track parallel to the runway like that. Uh, and then I way angled out. And I think what's going on here is I'm actually seeing the highway and following the highway. Um, so that's a good one to just catch myself on and not do. Because if you notice, I'm like, you know, outside the highway by that much and then continue to do that. Um, so what I need to be doing is looking at the runway and saying, okay, what's parallel to the runway regardless of the ground uh, things I'm seeing. Distance wise though, I think that was, yep, just about right. So uh, three fourths of a mile, mile or so. Could come in a little bit if I wanted to. The only other thing that uh, really stood out to me on this is these final legs. Um, actually the half mile is okay. Yeah, this is okay. So, so maybe that was fine. I'm just sort of coming out weird on the side here. All right. Um, oh, you know what we can do? We have just another minute here. So let me see if I can pull up something interesting in the track logs. So you've seen me do this before. Um, I'm recording the altitudes that we're flying at. And so you can see the same 
pattern that we were looking at and the track over the ground. And we can also see the descent rate then. So our normal descent rate um, coming into final here versus the descent rate that we were getting when we were using flat. So let's see if we can actually see that. Let's go like this. Oops, I the wrong one, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so there you go. So you can see, you know, our normal descent rate was actually what we were just looking at, but then the one that we had at the end of the lesson, when we were doing a, a really steep descent, you can see that sort of uh, aggressive angle that we're able to get with that forward slip, so. Consider it one more tool in your tool belt if you're trying to lose altitude without gaining airspeed. Um, get re to recapture glide slope is a great way to do it. Um, but uh, of course, the best thing to do is to have a nice clean pattern set up so that you're already at the altitude you need to be and nothing else that we need to do. All right, so I see a couple of Comments in the chat. Let me just look real quick, see what uh, if anything. A uh, flying turd. So that is a great idea and a great suggestion. Um, I would add a little bit to that, which is you mentioned, you know, maybe noting down what the different headings should be for each of the legs for it. And if you have a heading of like one, two, eight degrees, um, that level of precision might be a bit much for the amount of value add you're getting. So just doing, you know, runway one, three. So you're at one, one, three, you're going to see on the heading indicator instead of like one, two, eight, just the, the level of precision I don't think is, is required. Um, but that is a really good idea to be cross-checking. So if you are flying on runway 13 and you're making, uh, uh, let's say you're making uh, left traffic, so your next thing is going to be 90 degrees off from runway 13. So that's subtract nine is going to be four. So your next run, your next heading should be four, and then around and around. Um, you can also just look at the heading indicator and see because you've bugged up your runway heading. And so you can see when that bug is at 90 degrees on the heading versus 90 degrees versus 90 degrees. And um, that's another way to do it. And then just account for your wind on top of that. So you'd say, you know, I know I'm going to have to turn to basically where 90 degrees is plus a little bit uh, for the wind. Um, writing them down um, might be a bit much just because you're going to have, uh, you can see it so clearly on the heading indicator or just the quick math is good to be practicing anyway. Um, but the idea is really good. And actually, there are instructors who teach, you know, roll out to the heading indicator um, so that you're getting your, your clean 90 degrees. I tend to be of the camp that feels it's better to focus on flying to the angles you see relative to the runway, building up that understanding of your position relative to the runway, and then cross-checking on the heading indicator. Um, but even myself, I do do that for that, you know, 90 degrees outside, 10 degrees in, or 90% of the time looking outside, 10 degrees, 10% 10, 10 looking inside. So I will be looking at the runway, figuring out where I'm going to roll out to, and then confirm on my heading indicator that it's 90 degrees by looking at where the indicator bug is around that, that circle. So yeah, great suggestion. Um, and a good way to practice too, especially for a check ride, to be honest, it's kind of a nice sanity check you just want to make sure that you're not over relying on the instruments because we do want to be flying based on what we're seeing outside uh shoots of reading your message oh yeah so, uh, doing things like the uh the forward slips to a landing and things like that Yep, flying turd, happy to, and glad you liked the lesson. Yeah, forward slips are are great. They're a great tool. They're a great thing to practice and to have down um, for when you need them. 
Um, actually, I, so Flying Turd is someone who joins also for the social Tuesday flights. Um, and so you'll see me do these from time to time um, just because they're they're like really, really handy for getting your glide angle set up correctly. Um, but you can also do them uh, Flying Turd as a way to slow down. So, you know, we talk mostly about forward slips to a landing as a way to lose altitude without gaining airspeed. But you can also use them to lose airspeed without losing altitude. So if you hold off, um, it's the same sort of thing. You're just throwing the fuselage in and increasing drag. Um, so we do those social flights in the sim where we're trying to circle landmarks and you don't want to be going too fast around those landmarks. You can do the same sort of like cross-controlled um, forward. It's, it is a forward slip um, to kind of slow down there. So something to consider. Um, as, as a private pilot in this point in training, you wouldn't want to be doing that because you really are using this as a uh, an additional tool in your tool belt for what otherwise should be well set up patterns. Um, but for um, for a little bit further along, it's it's kind of a nice tool just because it increases drag. Uh, shoots. Shoots is asking, is it okay to start your turn while you're calculating the final angle in your head? Final heading, rather. Yeah, I think that's just fine. I mean, it kind of goes back to the the philosophy that I really push on with the, you know, two most important things in aviation are the next two things. So you really want to be thinking those two steps ahead. And so in the pattern, there's a lot of stuff going on. It may be that you are at the point of needing to turn before you have the bandwidth to go and figure out what your rollout's going to be. Um, but if you can just thinking about them beforehand, or as um, Flying Turd was saying, you know, you know what runway you're going to be on, you know the pattern you're going to be doing, you can have those all kind of mentally done. Um, the other thing to really consider is you don't necessarily need to be focused on the mental math there because you can see it on the heading indicator when you're turning. Um, so like, let me pop over to the, the sim real quick here. Cause I think this is a worthwhile thing just to, to, to look at really fast. So, um, if we go here and so you know, before we get on the runway, we bug up our runway heading. So let's say we're on runway, I guess we're running from 13, so we can set that actually up for today's flight. Okay, so we were bugged to 13. We would have had this bug, except we had to restart, and so that's why it's kind of wonky right now. But um, we'd be like this, and so you're going through your. Um, you're going through the turns, and. Um, and you see the heading bug here on the heading or the uh, the heading indicator, which is the exact same thing that you see in the aircraft. So, let's see if I can. <laughs> All of my buttons are not working how I expect. Why is that? Oh, that's why. Okay. Um, so our heading indicator here is the same one that we bugged up here. So just to say that that's the same representation you see in the aircraft. And so if we're flying along and we are flying at our runway heading, and then we turn to our crosswind, you can kind of at a glance see that this heading indicator you've already bugged is now at the 93 point. Um, so j just to say that the you may not need to be doing that mental math to make sure you have a specific number in mind as much as you can just visually check on your heading indicator where you bugged it out to. Um, and then, of course, it's important that you're also just looking over your shoulder um, and seeing, you know, Okay, so where is the, oops, if I could control this camera. So where am I relative to that runway and, and am I aligned with the, the 90 degree? Just to be building that muscle about the site picture. Um, yeah, but that would, I would say that that's more likely what I'm doing when I'm flying is instead of, maybe I'll have this specific number in mind. Um, I, if I want to make sure that I'm, I'm hitting it for some reason to have it very specific, but most likely I'm gonna look and say, okay, my heading indicator is now at you know, uh, 180 degrees to where I need to be, or my heading indicator is now at the 90 degree point. Um, so, yeah. A good point about the heading. Yeah. Yeah, flying turret, I think that's super fair. It is, there are a lot of parts of flying 
especially when we talk about traffic patterns and landings and things that I think are much easier to do in real and real flying. Um, when I was getting my instrument rating, one of the things that uh, my instructor said, and I, I think turned out to be super right, is like, if you can do these transitions to landing in the sim, because the real aircraft has actual weight and it behaves like a physical object that you can kind of get in tune with, the actual landings will be even smoother. Um, which is not to say never having flown in the real world, only flying sim will translate easier to the real world. But what I mean is just that the the physics of the whole thing, the feel of the machine, the feel of the flight, it's a lot easier to to you know look around and, and reason about your your surroundings. There are other weird things that come up in the sim too, where like if your field of view is different than your actual field of view because you're trying to see more, like either things will seem like they're moving faster or like the runway at 90 degrees doesn't look like it's at 90 degrees. So uh, there are some weird disadvantages to the sim piece of it. But yeah, using the the heading reference bugs in the sim, I think is is a good thing, um, or or can be a good thing. It sort of goes to the the tricky piece of practicing in the sim versus the real world, which is if you're flying a lot in the sim and you're in the habit of always looking at your instruments, then you're starting to get in the bad habit of not looking outside enough. So this is one of those um, you know sort of difficult areas with sim flying. Um, just to make sure that you're you're using your visual cues correctly. Uh, shoots, I'm reading your message. Oops. Yeah, I think that's right, Shoots. So it's good to be in the habit of bugging up headings that matter, um, especially if you decide to go on for your instrument rating because you're going to get instructions from ATC like fly heading 220 or fly heading 310 or something like that. or turn 15 degrees to the right. Um, and you need to be able to um, not only interpret what that means, but then also bug it up because you're going to have enough going on that you don't want to be having to memorize that number as much as just have it already recorded essentially in the instruments. So you can think of it as instead of writing it down on paper, you're you know, quote, writing it down on the heading indicator. Um, and yeah, and that's part of the reason we do for runway headings, we'll do that because now we have that reference there. Also when we're doing maneuvers, if we are doing slow flight, you can bug up your heading. Um, we're also using visual landmarks, so maybe we'll do a slow flight towards a mountain peak so we have that you know, visual that we're looking outside the airplane at, um, but cross-checking on the heading instrument to make sure. <laughs> flying dirt. Yeah. 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 There are, there are things that are trickier to do in the sim. Um, just, just for how the sim is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad everyone had a, a good lesson. Let me close out real quick uh, as we're getting just past one here. So completion standards here. Client must demonstrate smooth entry into a forward slip with upwind wing down, maintaining runway centerline and safe airspeed with smooth recovery from slip prior to round out. Touchdown within 400 feet beyond the specific landing point with no sideways drift and with airplane's longitudinal axis parallel to and over runway center. Um, run thing that actually reminds me of, and I'll, I'll show on the sim forces real quick here. I think um, when we roll into a forward slip, we're doing everything, everything we do in the airplane should be smooth. Um, but especially the forward slip's a good example of one where that's important. Um, because if you're knowing that you're going to put the rudder all the way down and you just jam the rudder down, you end up in a situation where, um, let me see if I can. Yeah. Okay. So I can do that. Um, so I'll go back to the sim here. So it says you have to be able to do a smooth entry into a forward slip and then also a smooth recovery to a, um, to out. So if you are in the sim and you jam your rudder, so I'm, I'm active paused and, and just kind of flying here, but if I jam my rudder to the right, watch the lift on the left wing here. Um, because in jamming my rudder to the right, I'm swinging that left wing around, generating more lift or generating more airspeed, which generates more lift. And that causes kind of a rolling moment. So you can get pretty unstable pretty quick. So if I go like that, 
So you can kind of see how, well, I really should have gone up more there, but that's all right. So you can kind of see that there's more lift being generated over here. Um, and so when you're rolling into and rolling out of, you want to be really smooth about that so you're not uh, going to suddenly get this strong rolling force up there. Uh, touchdown within 400 feet uh, with no sideways drift in the airplane's longitudinal axis parallel to and over the center line. So in the final FAA test, you do have to do a forward slip to landing, and then you are expected to land with no sideways drift, and you have to have the longitudinal axis parallel to and over the runway center line. Uh, no homework for today. This one is one that we'll be practicing periodically. Uh, we'll just do a lap around the pattern and then say, okay, let's stay high and do this as a forward slip. And no recommended homework either. Kind of a nice send off for the weekend. All right, I will see you all Monday. Thanks Flying Turd, you have a great weekend as well. Uh, and yeah, see you Monday for a ground session on airspace. Uh, should be pretty fun. I, it'll be less flying, but I, I really enjoy this sort of how the infrastructure of flying works in the country. It's, it's kind of a cool topic. So, all right, I'll see y'all later.